Hello, my name is Justin Wood. I work at the Economist Corporate Network where I look after Southeast Asia. And I'm here today to give an update on Indonesia. Indonesia, of course, a very important economy for all of our clients uh, investing here in Southeast Asia. Um, it's about $850 billion in size, easily the biggest economy in Southeast Asia, uh, makes up about 35% uh, of the region. 240 million people, the fourth most populous country in the world. Um, and lots of very exciting things happening in terms of a uh, uh, very dynamic consumer sector, um, a huge natural resource sector, uh, lots of things going on. But I think what's perhaps most interesting and exciting at the moment is that Indonesia is going through um, a political transition. We've had parliamentary elections earlier this year, um, and in July we had presidential elections contested between Joko Widodo, Jokowi, and uh, Prabowo Subianto. And this week, uh, middle, middle of August, we have had it confirmed that uh, Jokowi Widodo, uh, sorry, J Joko Widodo will be the next president of uh, Indonesia. So a political transition in a very important economy, it's an exciting time to be talking about the country. And for that reason, the Economist Corporate Network held a meeting this morning. Uh, we put together a panel of four Indonesia experts to talk about where they see the country going and what investors should be thinking about and expecting um, in the years ahead. And the purpose of this video is I want to just share with you a very brief summary of some of the ideas and thoughts that uh, came out of our meeting um, this morning. So let me start with the, uh, the political. Um, I think there was a strong sense that uh, Jokowi is going to be a new type of leader for the country. If you look over the past 70 years of history in Indonesia, uh, every single one of its leaders has either come from a, a military background, um, has come from an established um, moneyed political party, has been a bureaucrat, uh, and for the first time we have really a common man in Jokowi taking uh, the leadership role. Um, and that is something which I think is very exciting and quite new, but it's also going to be very challenging for him because he has no political platform upon which to rely, no political party um, backing him. He did, of course, campaign um, with the backing of PDIP, but it's not his party. Uh, he was just a nominated candidate by them. So he's something of a loner. And I think in order for him to succeed, there was a strong sense at our meeting this morning that he's going to need to develop a new leadership model. And interestingly, he has um, actually developed that. We know that um, his current role, which he's about to give up, is as governor of Jakarta. And it was during that, um, while he was in that role, that he really developed this new model for getting things done in a political sense without necessarily having a big political constituency um, behind him. Um, and the way that he did it really is by uh, canvassing a public opinion and building waves of public um, support behind his policies um, and his ideas. Uh, and he's continuing to do that now. Um, as he moves into the presidential role, he of course has to pick a cabinet. Um, and in the past, cabinets have always been um, peopled largely by politicians uh, and people in power who've, who've uh, traded uh, and, and pushed for positions of influence. And Jokowi wants to a different model. He wants to fill his cabinet with technocrats. Um, and so how will he be able to achieve that vision of putting in place competent technocrats rather than uh, well-positioned politicians? Well, he's turned to social media and on Facebook and other platforms, he has invited the public to suggest who they think would be good cabinet um, uh, members. Uh, a bit like the sort of American Idol model, it's putting it out to the public vote through this social media platform. Um, and I think this is how he plans to get things done. Um, I don't think that he's going to use this as a model for getting everything done, but when he comes across political opposition and vested interests and difficult situations, he can turn around and say, I've asked the public, this is what the public wants. Um, and so when it comes to his cabinet, um, of course, um, he won't take on board everything that they say, but he will use this public backing as a way to push through some of the things that he wants to get done. Another big question uh, alongside his leadership style is, uh, the coalition that will be behind him in Parliament. Uh, when he went into the presidential election, he only had 30%. Uh, the parties forming his coalition only formed 30% of Parliament. Um, and obviously he needs more than 50% to rule. The sense that came out of our meeting today is that actually he will have no trouble in building uh, a coalition of more than 50%. Uh, 
the parties, uh, now that they're aware that he's the president and confirmed in that role, will switch sides quite easily away from uh, Prabowo Subianto um, and back into, uh, or towards rather, uh, the Jokowi camp. Um, he will, of course, um, struggle a little bit as a political novice to keep this coalition together and get them approving his policies. But as I say, he'll use this tool of harnessing public opinion. Uh, and he also has a very competent, politically connected vice president in Yusuf Kala. And he will use Yusuf Kala and this publicity, public opinion tool to help him achieve um, some of his goals. Um, I think what's also quite important about this political transition is that for the first time really ever, we have a leadership team of Jokowi as president, Yusuf Kala as vice president, who are both um, very business friendly. They both come from the private sector. And that hasn't really happened in Indonesia um, before. So there was a strong sense we got today that we can expect this leadership team to be pro-business, business friendly, um, and receptive to uh, is business issues um, and concerns. Against that, we also have to recognize the fact that the policy direction in Indonesia has become increasingly nationalist um, and protectionist. And there is really a secular trend of rising nationalism in the country that's been very apparent for a number of years now. And there was a strong sense today that we should not expect that to change. Indonesia is, uh, has had a commodity boom, as we know, for the last uh, 10, 15 years. And there's a strong sense in the country that Indonesia itself has not benefited as much from that commodity boom um, as it should have done. And I think also there's a strong sense that everything, all the economic activity happening in the country, Indonesia is not capturing enough of the value uh, in that activity. And so politicians, the media, academics, policymakers, there's a real uh, consensus among them that Indonesia needs to capture some of this value that they've been missing. So we can expect nationalist protectionist measures to continue to rise. Um, if you're selling into Indonesia, the chances are that you're going to increasingly be forced to make stuff in Indonesia in order to sell it there. Um, foreign ownership restrictions likely to um, rise rather than to fall. This protectionist uh, nationalist sentiment is going to continue as Indonesia bids to capture more of the value that it thinks the economy uh, is creating. What other policies can we expect? Well, I think the most important policy that needs to be addressed is around fuel subsidies. Um, as we all know, uh, fuel prices in Indonesia heavily subsidized by the government and the cost of those subsidies really crippling government finances. Um, so this year, I believe the value of those subsidies is about 400 trillion rupee, or about 25% of the government's budget. Um, and both candidates in the pre recent election, uh, Jokowi and uh, Prabowo, said that they would address these subsidies, they will reduce them, so the cost of fuel will go up, but the purpose is to create fiscal space, to release these funds away from subsidizing uh, petrol and diesel and allow them to invest it in infrastructure, allow them to invest it in education, um, and allow them to invest it in healthcare. Um, and that, of course, is very positive. There are questions around the pace and the speed and the timing of these scaling back of the subsidies, but we can expect that, and that's the most important thing probably that uh, Jokowi needs to do. Uh, and I expect to hear an announcement around that in terms of fuel price increases within the first three months in office. Another policy that there was a strong consensus in our meeting today that will be uh, part of his platform is to reform the bureaucracy. If you look at the government bureaucracy in Indonesia, it's very much uh, built in a sort of 1950s, 1960s model, um, all about serving a, uh, a central power base, a dictator, if you like, um, very much in the Suharto mold. And I think it's, it's deemed wholly inappropriate to a, a modern dynamic democracy um, with accountability and transparency and so on. Um, so Jokowi has said that he plans to reform the bureaucracy, um, and this is clearly something that the country needs. Um, and our experts today strongly felt that that would be a big part of his policy platform. They have enacted a bureaucracy reform law, but it hasn't been implemented, uh, and there's a long way to go to get it implemented, but Jokowi will work towards achieving that. I suppose a related policy that people are expecting is one around general business licensing and regulations. Um, again, Jokowi, given that he comes from a business background, has expressed on many occasions deep frustration with the regulations around licensing a business and running a business, um, and we can expect improvements in terms of how uh, company, the, the regulations that companies have to deal with uh, and the licenses that they have to get. 
Another policy is going to be around transparency um, and good governance. Um, Jokowi is a, is a passionate supporter of, of uh, transparency and fighting corruption. Um, and I think that um, you know, many of the policies he's announced are all around about trying to improve this, uh, this transparency. So, for example, he on many occasions appears obsessed with, uh, with uh, e-governance um, and e-budgeting uh, and e-licensing, putting everything onto the internet, taking out middlemen, taking away the opportunity for bribes, making everything transparent and clear. Um, and so I think this e-government is just one sort of reflection of his commitment that will continue towards uh, improving governance and fighting corruption in the country. Um, of course, it's not going to be easy. There are many vested interests that are going to stand in his way. Um, but as a statement of intent, he's already said that three of the biggest battles he intends to fight um, are against the Migas Mafia, so-called, um, the, 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 the people who control the oil and gas sector uh, in the country, the Rice Mafia, who control the import and export of rice, um, and the Hajj Mafia, who um, obviously control the religious migration. Um, so he's taking on food, fuel, and religion, um, which are, of course, extremely important parts of Indonesia. Um, shows no shortage of ambition on his part. Um, he's voiced concerns around these, said he intends to tackle them, um, and I think that is a statement of intent. It's going to be very hard. These are some of the wealthiest, most well-connected segments of Indonesia, but he's put his, uh, his stall out there, so we can expect to see this corruption battle continue. So that's the policy side of things. What can we expect um, uh, from the economy? Well, if you look at how the economy has been performing, it's been a huge beneficiary of the commodity super cycle, the commodity boom of the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, uh, Indonesia is a huge producer of uh, crude palm oil and thermal coal and, and metal ores and so on, uh, and it's been exporting those and enjoying the very high prices, and that's really supported um, the, the economy. Not only has it brought in valuable export revenue, but it's stimulated an investment boom within the country as, as companies invest into natural resources. Um, it's also stimulated strong growth in private consumption. For example, on palm oil plantations, the high prices of the palm oil fed through into rural wages, fed through into rural spending. That's been a huge driver of economic growth um, in the country. But at our meeting today, and I think quite broadly, there is a strong sense that the commodity boom is now over. Commodity prices have softened dramatically, particularly for something like coal, and those prices likely to stay um, depressed for the foreseeable future. And that's going to feed through into uh, the trend rate of growth that we can expect from uh, Indonesia, because the benefits and the second order benefits that came from this ex these high commodity prices are not going to be nearly so evident um, in the future. At the Economist Intelligence Unit, when we look out over the next five years, we're looking at a trend growth rate of between six and six and a half percent. But our meeting today, there were others who express a bit more concern and think that the trend growth rate may well be more like five to five and a half percent. And if you look back at the 10 years or, the, or the, the years immediately preceding the commodity boom, that was actually what Indonesia was achieving. It was growing at about five, five and a half percent. With the commodities, it went up to six, six and a half, occasionally seven percent. And they argue that now without that commodity boost, uh, boost to growth, it's going to drop back to five, five and a half. So some debate there, um, but certainly the, the high rates of growth over the last three or four years um, are going to slow somewhat um, in, the, in the years ahead. Inflation um, is high in Indonesia, um, partly because of uh, things like the currency falling, making imports more expensive, um, and um, partly because of increases in fuel prices, some of which were introduced last year. So inflation likely to stay high because fuel is going to keep getting more expensive, as I already mentioned. Um, and inflation being high is causing interest rates to be high, um, and that's going to slow down the ability of companies and consumers to borrow and to service debt. Um, and so that's also going to act as a drag on growth. So it's still an exciting picture, um, whether you think it's going to be five or six, um, but nonetheless a little bit slower than we have become used to. One concern is the currency. Uh, we've seen a lot of volatility in the currency, a lot of depreciation in the rupiah, um, over recent times um, for various reasons, um, not least the um, whole uh, situation in, in America with quantitative easing being scaled back and so um, global investors pulling money out of emerging markets. Um, that will remain a risk for Indonesia that um, as American economy improves, as interest rates there rise, that more money does get sucked out of Indonesia causing the currency to depreciate. 
But there was a strong consensus uh, at our meeting today that it, uh, Indonesia is actually um, over the worst and quite well placed from a currency perspective. Um, here at the, the Economist Intelligence Unit, we actually think the currency is going to appreciate from now, um, not by a dramatic amount, but it'll strengthen gradually over the years ahead. At our meeting today, some others expressed a different view. They think it'll depreciate, but not by very much, perhaps by 1% or 2% um, a year. What none of us are expecting, uh, and we think we can rule out with reasonable confidence, is any kind of currency crash from here. Indonesia has, of course, had huge uh, crashes in the past, but we think that the whole financial structure of the, of the country, uh, the structure of its debt and its foreign borrowing, is now uh, much lower on a much longer duration, better maturity, um, and so we think that uh, a rupiah crash is unlikely. Um, uh, and uh, um, so from that perspective, the risk is much reduced um, compared to the past. Looking at a medium-term basis, what do we think are the strengths um, in Indonesia? Well, at the meeting today, we identified three which um, stand out. Uh, natural resources is the first. Natural resource, the Indonesia is and continues to be very well endowed in natural resources, and that will be um, a source of strength for the economy uh, continuing into the future. Demographics is a, a, an equally positive uh, story. Indonesia has one of the best, youngest uh, demographic profiles in the world. Uh, it's also a very large population and growing, uh, and will keep growing until about 2046, I think, is our estimate for the workforce to keep growing. So there's a very strong potential demographic dividend if the country can harness that labor and put it to productive work. So natural resources, um, demographics, and then land. There's, 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 there's huge opportunities for developing um, Indonesia's land. But with each of those three strengths, there are also challenges. For natural resources, the whole licensing regime and the regulations are very, very difficult and put off a lot of investment. They need to be reformed. They need to be streamlined. Jokowi has talked about doing this. It's not going to be easy. But if he can improve the regulatory and licensing regime around natural resources, that will be a very strong performer for, uh, for Indonesia. There's huge energy resources there. Um, if you look at uh, coal bed methane, um, Indonesia has a lot that hasn't even begun to be developed. So they could potentially be sitting on lots of valuable uh, uh, energy to drive the economy uh, that just needs to be um, harnessed with a new regulatory regime. On the demographics, uh, what's holding back the sort of the, the labor story in Indonesia is very draconian, tough labor laws, um, which really uh, prevent companies from hiring as much as they should or, or would like to. Um, so, if, for example, you lay off a worker, you normally have to pay retrenchment of between six months and a year's worth of salary. So this, of course, causes businesses to hold back from hiring, and instead they tend to work with... Uh, uh, staff who are on short, three-term rolling contracts, which means that there's very low staff loyalty, high staff turnover, um, no one invests in education and training, um, and so on. And so we really need to see Indonesia harness this demographic dividend by uh, simplifying um, and relaxing the labor laws. Um, and if they are able to do that, then this demographic dividend will be very powerful, and it will feed through uh, into potentially a very exciting manufacturing story. This was another thing that we talked about at the meeting today, the potential for Indonesia to be a manufacturing powerhouse. Uh, there was a strong sense that uh, manufacturing can be good for the economy, um, sorry, can develop quite nicely, but it's going to be focused mostly on serving the domestic market, at least at first. We're very unlikely to see Indonesia develop an export manufacturing um, story that's uh, particularly powerful at this stage. Um, in time, that may come. Um, certainly our, our economist at the EIU um, does believe that Indonesia will increasingly plug ever more into global supply chains um, over the next uh, three to five years. But certainly for now, um, the manufacturing investment coming into the country is going to be more about serving the uh, domestic story. And that export story will really only be unlocked if and when they can loosen up these labor regulations um, and uh, make it easier to hire workers uh, and more flexibility in doing so. And then the final uh, benefit, the final strength, the, the, the land, again, the challenge there is all about um, being able to buy it. We know that um, land titles are very uncertain and difficult to manage uh, in Indonesia, and so we need uh, new things like eminent domain laws that um, allow the government to step in and buy the land that they need to develop infrastructure. Um, and until they make this whole land purchasing um, easier, more secure, and more transparent, it's going to be difficult to harness this um, this uh, land opportunity um, in, 
in, uh, that we see in Indonesia. So those are some of the highlights that came out of our meeting today. A very exciting economy at a very interesting moment. I think the phrase I would sum up is cautious optimism. People think that Jokowi represents a bright new future for Indonesia, but it's going to be a big challenge for him to harness everything that Indonesia has to offer. Um, and I think that um, we shouldn't expect too much in the first year. The first year is going to be difficult. He's going to be finding his way. The budget for 2015 has already been set by his predecessor, um, uh, Suzlo Bambang Yudhoyono. So there's not a lot that he can do in the first year, um, but something like announcing um, major reform to fuel prices would be a big step in the right direction. And I think incrementally, we'll start to see him uh, make more and more um, headway as we, uh, as, we, as we go through this first year. Thank you.